We're ready. We're on. All right. God bless and welcome to each and every one of you. Uh, I am Elder Superintendent Nathaniel Green, and we want to welcome you uh, to Courageous Conversations. Uh, we are so excited uh, to be able to have this dialogue on this evening that is being hosted uh, by Bishop J. Drew Sheard and J. Drew Sheard Ministries. I also want to thank God for another co-facilitator that I'm serving with on this evening, Elder Nick South. And uh, we are excited about some very courageous conversations that are going to be taking place on this evening. Elder South, what you got to say about it, man, before we jump in? Man, brother Nathaniel, it's so good to see you. Deference and honor to our uh, Bishop J. Drew Shear, general board member. Uh, what a joy and privilege it is to share with uh, some of the brightest and best minds that our church has to offer. Um, as you know, Courageous Conversations um, is an opportunity for us to share uh, concerning some of the most pivotal and poignant uh, uh, issues that our uh, church and generations are facing. As a member of Generation X, I'm so proud to say uh, that as a member of the Church of God in Christ, my generation exhibits characteristics such as commitment, consistency, and we are courageous. We're committed even when it doesn't benefit us personally. But there are some other issues and topics that we want to discuss with Bishop Sheard on tonight. And we thought it not robbery to share with your generation, the millennials. And hopefully, you know, you all can learn a little something as we share here on tonight. Absolutely. And we're not going to belabor the time because we have a lot of ground to cover. It's going to be invigorating. It's going to be insightful. And I believe it's going to be most definitely empowering as well. But we want to thank God for the man who has provided this platform for us to share because of his concern for the church at large. And at this time, we want to yield the floor uh, to our host on this evening and visionary Bishop J. Drew Shear. Let's say amen for him as he comes. <laughs> you, 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 you are, uh, you are a, uh, 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 you're really, you're really church of God in Christ. Uh, or, or, maybe, or maybe I should say you're really church. Uh, let's say amen as he comes. That's, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's funny. Okay. But <laughs> excited. I, I don't know what happened. I think that uh, Elder uh, South and uh, Elder uh, and, and Elder Green, I want you all, uh, we're going to get right into this. I'm ready to go. Uh, we got some outstanding people, courageous conversation. You know, I have a saying at my church, uh, uh, Elder South and Superintendent Green, and I, when I say something and then I say, I ain't scared of y'all, and then I go on and say something, you got to have courage to say uh, things that might offend people, but yet at the same time, you know it's right. So those are the kind of conversations we're going to be having uh, when we say courageous conversation. It's going to be some stuff that uh, you got to have courage to say. And so let's get started because, uh, you know, uh, this is an hour early uh, for our normal broadcast. And so some people will pick up, but we're hoping that we won't be too long, but we're hoping that we will gain the attention of our viewers and that we can hold you for a while. Cause we're going to say, we're going to talk about some stuff. Yes, Absolutely. sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. As, 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 the, as the kids say, let's roll with it. All right. And listen, for those of you that are watching, we want to encourage you right now. If you have not done so yet, would you like and share this post like and share this post. It is your likes and your shares that help us to reach as many people as we possibly can for the benefit of the kingdom of God. So please do that for us right now. If you have not done so, the Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. Praise God. Since okay. you quoted the scripture, let's have a word of prayer because we got uh, we want to be covered by God. Dear God, we thank you once again for how you have uh, permitted us to have this conversation. And we ask, oh God, that even though we will have these serious conversations, that you will cover us, oh God, and keep us in the sin of your will. It is always our desire to be pleasing in your eyes. In Jesus' name, thank God. Amen. 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 Well, we're, we're going to jump right in. We're excited. We have some awesome uh, uh, guest facilitators that are going to be sharing with us on this evening, two in particular that are coming to share. Uh, we're going to announce them. Evangelist 
Sheila Vickers. We are so glad to have her with us on this evening. Uh, this woman is a powerhouse. You've never, amen. If you've never heard her minister the word of God, you are missing a great treat. Uh, she is a third generation member of the Church of God in Christ and a member of the third ecclesiastical jurisdiction of Eastern New York under the leadership of uh, Bishop Frank Anthon White uh, and local church Mason Temple Church of God in Christ in Brooklyn, New York, uh, where her brother elder, Arcel Vickers, is the pastor. Uh, she is well-traveled and astute a uh, well-studied woman of God and uh, is just what I call oily. She got a lot of oil on her, uh, but we're so glad, uh, Evangelist Vickers, that you had time in your schedule to join us on this evening. So we welcome you. Also, we're glad to have with us uh, this innovative, uh, bright mind in the church, Elder Marlon Bush. Uh, this young man is a native of Chicago, Illinois. He currently lives in Dallas, Texas. Woo -woo. Uh, Elder Bush uh, has been in marketing and design uh, for business more than 15 years. And his creativity has literally taken him across the nation in religious fields and secular fields as well. And uh, he's doing some great things. And so we're glad to have you with us as well, uh, Elder Bush. These two are going to be sharing with us in a dialogue uh, in our first segment uh, concerning uh, culture and climate. We're dealing with the culture and the climate of the church. You want to share uh, some questions uh, with Bishop Sheard on this evening. So, Elder Bush, Evangelist Vickers, uh, I want to put it in your hands. Thank you, uh, Elder Nathan, Superintendent Nathaniel Green and Elder South. Bishop, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to have this conversation with you. Um, so we're going to jump right in. You said you're going to be very open, so we're going to ask some hard questions. We're going to be courageous enough to ask those hard questions. Okay. Um, so as a millennial, our ideology about what success looks like drives about the ability to be committed. I would like to discuss the church addressing the culture where the church has vast needs, viewing paradigm shifts, the church has employed the same infrastructure in many regards for 100 years. So this is my question to you, Bishop. As a millennial, as a millennial, not only as a millennial, but as an approved candidate for the trustee board, how do I effectively contribute my gifts and talents to move the ministry, the vision, and impact of the church forward and not be met with resistance because it differs from what has already been done? Well, you know what, and, and I'm so glad you're here, uh, Elder Bush. You know, I um, uh, I don't know, I guess that's echo. I don't know what that is, but uh, I'm so glad you're here, and I appreciate uh, you for being here. Uh, you got a great family. You know, your dad is a great friend of mine, and uh, and so I'm so thankful for for you, and especially uh, Evangelist Vickers. She knows she's one of my favorites, and uh, I appreciate her so very much. But listen, let me say, you know, a lot of times, uh, one of the things that uh, we have a a a a problem with is that sometimes we get stuck in tradition, and uh, tr sometimes traditions are good, but there's a difference between tradition and doctrine. And uh, traditions are practices, and they're not necessarily, uh, you're not necessarily not saved if you don't deal, go with this tradition. And so what we need, bold leadership, it has to be a leadership that takes hold to our traditions and takes hold to the new concept and somehow bridge these gaps. It's, it, it has been, um, I want to share with you because uh, um, I've been noted as, uh, and I say this very humbly, I've been noted as a bridge builder. And uh, I've, been able, I've been successful at having conversations with our seniors and, and at the same time knowing the mindset of our younger people, and I've been able to uh, tr kind of bridge those gaps. Now, one of the things that has to happen is that when we get in to our culture, our culture sometimes tells us that certain things can't happen. Our culture, however, is something that we help develop as we go. And 
it's, it's called being a trailblazer because a lot of times you can get stuck in a culture and the future will pass you right by. I remember when I first started pastoring, I, I like to tell this story because it's kind of humorous. Uh, and, um, I, you know, just let me tell it. <laughs> anyway, uh, when I first started pastoring, um, my church, I only had eight people when I first started pastoring. And uh, and I remember as we got going, Elder Bush, and we started going, but I started uh, having church on time and getting out. I'd cut what uh, what you hear me say sometimes is I'd cut the fat out of my service. And so I recall one night my wife and I said, uh, let's go by mama's house. We're talking about Dr. Maddie Moss Clark. And so I went, we went over to my mother-in-law's house and my mother-in-law said, well, where y'all coming from? We said church. And she said, what y'all doing at church? She said, y'all done had church. And I said, yeah. And she said, oh, y'all ain't done nothing. <laughs> you know, because we had had service, what I call a quality service and not quantity, you know, and, and that is very important that we start thinking, are we giving the people quality and not quantity? Uh, so a hundred years old plus, a hundred years plus our church is, but are we giving the people quality and not quantity? And what took, what gave them quality 50 years ago may be too much for right now. They may not need that much. I often say that even in preaching, uh, Superintendent uh, Green hears me say this all the time. You know, we some of us preaching for hours and the people ain't getting about 15 minutes of it. So you got to be bold enough. I hope I'm dealing with your, your, your question. You got to be bold enough to say, let's make some changes here so we can be effective. Because now you got a whole new mindset in the church. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. With that answer, I absolutely appreciate that that conversation. Is I have one other question in this area. Um, given our current cogent culture and climate that you spoke to, what is your perspective about the contrast of celebrating individuals and promoting the skill set that benefit the institution? Well, I. I, I I sincerely, uh, let me, let me, let me see what, why I got, uh, uh, this contrast, uh, this echo. I don't know. I don't know if somebody's in my house got this stuff working, but they should put it on mute. Don't y'all say I said nothing, nobody, <laughs> but, uh, you're talking about, um, uh, this concept of say it one to me real quickly. One more time, brother Marlon. So, Bishop, I'm asking, in the coaching culture, we celebrate an individual more than we celebrate the skill set. When you talk about the climate and the culture of the church, how do we celebrate individuals and, and promoting the skill set that benefits the institution? Well, first of all, you know, uh, talented individuals will always get attention. You know, they, they get attention, talented individuals, and sometimes... Uh, we're not really getting to uh, their lifestyle. I'm gonna, I'm gonna mess up right here. I'm gonna tell you all, already, Marlon, uh, because we got talented, you know, gifts and calling out without repentance, and you got talented individuals who are not necessarily living the life that we would like to, uh, 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 you know, elevate into leadership. So consequently, um, we got to be careful that we don't get so carried away with their talent until we forget that, I'm, I'm gonna sound old fashioned here, that we're a holiness church. Uh, we don't wanna forget that. We, want the, we don't wanna forget that we have a standard, but at the same time, we're supposed to be able to, 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 to move individuals and recognize their ability to add to our organization, to our church, to our uh, whatever we're dealing with. I'm, I'm of the opinion that uh, uh, a lot of times I, I will say that I don't have to like you to use you. And, I, and that use is not bad. 
Uh, I don't have to, I, and when and that like is not bad. I mean, I don't have. We don't have to be buzz bosom buddies in order for me to recognize your ability to make something happen. Because we should all have this common goal, and when we have this common goal, then we continue to work towards that common goal. Now, how how many other people add into it? We should not be caught up on their personalities, but rather their ability, their God-given ability and their willingness to conform with our standards of sanctification. I hope I answered you. Yes, sir. And I actually appreciate that um, answer because a lot of times we are not all the same or alike, but in the same likeness, we have skills that can benefit the institution if we can look past the differences. Sure. So that's all I have for that area, Superintendent. Wow. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Bishop. Bless you, man. Good to see you. Awesome. 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 Evangelist Vickers, weigh in for Oh, Superintendent Green, thank you so much. Bishop Sheard, God bless you, and I applaud you um, for this opportunity to have this conversation. Um, I was listening to you speak to Elder Bush, and this is definitely moving toward change. So I have a question. I am Generation X. And I am old enough to have sat under the silent generation and even the baby boomers, but I am the generation that sits between those and the millennials. Um, we as a denomination, we have, like you said, we have established customs and ideas, even policies and historical practices. How can we balance what we are actually um, referring to as personal preference and ambition above what is tried, true, and tested practices that just need to be evolutionized. In other words, how do we reevaluate the efficacy and the impact for relevance for the generation that we're going to leave this church to without compromising our foundation? Well, you know what, Evangelist Vickers, and, um, um, are we relevant? You know, that's the key. That's the key thing, because, you know, uh, you've got a lot of people who are leaving our churches. That, and, and, you know, we got to get to the point where we understand that just because a person is leaving our church doesn't mean that they're necessarily backsliding. It may be that we're not relevant. We may be saved, but we ain't relevant. <laughs> And and one of the one of the the things is is that uh, we 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 sometimes get so bogged down into what we've been doing until we don't see that that it can be it can be tailored. Nobody nobody I I never uh, you know when a person tells me you know that the uh, Lord told them to go to another ministry I, and here's something that we do that's bad we kill them we bad mouth them. You know, hey, hey, she the all that, that that's that, and that's not the thing to do. The thing to do is um, try to find out what it is about that other ministry that attracted them, and what I am not doing to hold the people uh, that God has that I say that God has given me, or is it to a point now where they just outgrown me, and and that and and that and that's not a. Uh, you know, at some point, for instance, I was, I love my dad, you know, uh, and I was his assistant pastor. But at some point, I emerged into another past. I'll never forget. Uh, my uncle said to me, he said, man, he said, why don't you just stay here and help build the church? And, you know, you just it will continue to be the pastor and your dad will be the senior pastor, da, 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 da. But Look at how, I mean, the way my church has grown. What if I had allowed them to keep me harnessed in? Um, we've got to be able to expand. We've got to, and 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 growth, it hurts sometimes, but it ain't wrong. You know, uh, when I was, uh, uh, I shot up, uh, Sister Vickers, as a young person. I've been this height ever since I've been about 12 years old. I shot up and I, I was thinking I was going to be six, six. And I, I did, I never thought at that time, perhaps that I would be sitting here having this conversation. I thought that maybe at this time I would be retired basketball player, you know, but 
I shot up, but what happened to me, I shot up so fast until the cartilages in my knees didn't, didn't keep up with my growth. And I was in pain for many, many, uh, maybe a couple of years. But what I'm saying is my cartilages finally caught up with my growth. Uh, when I took over Greater Emmanuel, I had a few people there and they were used to doing something. One lady said, we can't have Sunday night service and, and all of and perhaps uh, uh, um, most of you know about my Sunday night services, when, if we can ever get back in the church. But I have these booming Sunday night services. But she said to me, she said, we'll never, we, that never worked. We'll never be able to do that. And I said, well, I tell you what, just let me hold on to my coattail. If you don't see it, I say, just hold on. Let me drag you for a minute and let's see if it's going to work. Our people in our churches have got to be willing to see other ideas and not be threatened by the persons who are bringing new ideas to enhance ministry. If we, if we never get to that place where we can appreciate your ingenuity, your innovativeness and, and stuff like that. If we can't do that, we're losing the battle. And our younger people, our, uh, the, the, the different ge uh, generations that you uh, acknowledge, uh, they're going to continue to go to other ministries because we're not uh, doing ministry. Ministry, let me throw this in. Ministry, ministry is defined as meeting the needs of people. Mm. And if you stop meeting the needs of people, you have ceased to do ministry. Now, if your, st if your stuff works, if it works, keep doing it. But don't be afraid. And and, and my, my children, Kiara and J. Drew, are constantly pushing me to, to, to do some edgy things. And, uh, and then I sometimes I have to just say, no, 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 wait, let's let's uh, let's hold it there. But they you know, you got to and you got to surround yourself with smart people you know that's why i got uh nick south and 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 nathaniel green and sheila vickers and and, and marlon bush on there because smart people make you look good remember that leaders smart people make you look good it ain't always you but they make you look good and if you're willing to be to for, for people to feed into you so that you can uh, do things that can become more more relevant, then you'll see that you'll grow along with the organization that you're growing with. Wow. Thank you, Bishop. Wow. Wow. That's good, Bishop. Thank you so much, too, for, for letting us know that we're smart. That, that encouraged my heart today. Uh, you have really blessed me. Uh, I, I do want to ask something, though, Bishop. You uh, mentioned a word that is a very powerful word, um, called relevance. And you asked the question, are we relevant? Now, uh, I want to ask you a question myself. Uh, and I, you know, I don't know if you want to share your age tonight. Uh, but well, I, I don't care. You know, I don't care. I, I, matter of fact, my birthday is the first of January. So I'll be 62 Friday. Good God almighty. You look good, Bishop. Thank you, sir. You hang in there, Bishop. You hang in there. I'm gonna pay y'all a dollar piece for that. <laughs> I'll send you my cash out. Um, but you have been here long enough to uh, be able to see uh, church today versus church in your day, church in your parents' day. Can you address what made the church relevant um, in your time uh, or in your father's time? versus what makes church relevant today. Because sometimes what will make us relevant today isn't always what made us relevant yesterday. Well, the the, the thing that makes us relevant, uh, and when I say when I say this, I'm speaking of in particularly the Pentecostal church. Okay. Right. The thing that makes let, let's 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 establish this. This is the this is the very foundation. The thing that makes the Pentecostal church, uh, uh, what you what you're talking about, that relevance is the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. 
Come on. Okay. We can, we can't. I mean, we can we can we can if you're gonna be a Pente- if you're gonna be Pentecostal, you can you can work all around that, but that has to be your focal point. Yeah. And and we and and that is, in my opinion, a lot of our churches are 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 drifting away from that Pentecostalism because we think they started thinking that uh you can't be uh relevant doing that jumping and shouting. And I don't say you got to shout like me because, you know, I'm a praiser. I don't say you got to shout like me. I don't say you got to, you know, but every now and then you ought to do something. If you in the Pentecostal church, you ought, you ought to shake your head or something every now. See, that's now that's the old school stuff right there. But it's got to it's got to be it's got to be prevalent today. Now, here's some here's some things just like I shared with you earlier. Um, I came up under Bishop Bailey. Um, we went to church for Sunday school at 930. We got out of Sunday morning service about 3 30, 4 o'clock. Then we were back at six o'clock for YPWW, and we wouldn't get out of church until sometime after midnight. Now, were all of those services so wonderfully spirited and relevant? Absolutely not. But in those, sir, hear what I'm saying? In those services, there was that time, and it may come at any time now, that was that time when you experienced the power of God. Now, here, let me go back. So you heard me say that I cut the fat out of my service because I contend that, you know, um, we ain't waiting on God. I mean, you know, yeah, we ain't waiting on God. God waiting on us. And so as soon as we prepare ourselves to, to, to hear from God, there it is. So you'll come to my church and my service started at seven o'clock. We'll be going home at 830 because we cut that out. My, my son, my 830 service on Sunday morning at 930, we, we threw. Now that's a look. Now that's a little different service for those who've been to that service. We know and watch yourself, Nathaniel. That's a little different service. And then my 1130 is this uh full spirited service, but we saw at 1130, 115, we out of there, you know. And so um I just think that people, here's one thing people have to do is that when you assign people to do things, they got to stick to the task. Mm-hmm. I went to our presiding bishop's church uh, when I first started pastoring, Bishop Charles Blake. I don't mind saying this. Uh, uh, you know, I love Bishop Blake. And uh, but uh, I went to because I heard him say, follow me home. Mm-hmm. I followed him home, Sister Sister Sheila. I followed him home. When I got there, I noticed these people standing in line to get in this church. And so you would stand in line, then they'd usher you in. Well, they'd wait after that, after the service over, they'd had those people come out one door and then they, they'd clean and crew would go in, clean up, and then you go in out another door. And then that service was starting. Then there's another line forming after that. Okay. And one thing I found out in it uh, by a viewing is that he didn't have a lot of talking and going on. So I came home to my little my little bitty church here in Detroit. I came home and I told my uh, what we call worship leader. I said, no, you ain't doing that no more. Well, how are we going to do that? I said, we're going to meet beforehand. Everybody going to know what they got to do. And if you come to my church today, you will find that people get up. If, if Elder Green is doing the prayer, he gets up and he says, I'm uh, Superintendent Nathaniel Green and it's our time for our consecration prayer. Everyone stand. And when he gets through, uh, you know, the next person comes up and then it does, and then the choir is saying. But what it did is it cut the it cut that worship leader, as we call them, an MC Ellis South from getting up preaching behind everything. And then when it's time for me to preach, the folk go out. Right, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, so, absolutely, Bishop. I, you know, and that happened in my in my early church sometime throughout my uh, even in my uh, father's ministry, um, you know, and uh, they would my church is a little different. You, We don't have an MC or a, 
uh, uh, somebody getting up announcing who's coming next. Just get up and do what you got to do and sit down. And when I get people that get up and go off and not doing what they're doing, I hit the chair and say, stick to the task. <laughs> yeah, I, I witnessed you doing that. Uh, <laughs> Now, now I, I'll say this, Bishop, and, and, and Bush has another question. We're, in a second, we're going to go into our next segment. But I did have a question uh, that came in from someone uh, in the audience. And their question was, what is the definition of relevance? What, how do you define being relevant? And is the church today uh, not a, uh, I'm sorry, is church today not appropriate or is it not connected? How do you define relevance? And is the church today appropriate or not connected? Well, well, relevance means uh, uh, relating to the matter at hand. That's that's what re relevance means. It means relating to the matter at hand. So now here here's how we define relevance. Of course, I got a principle. On the on the on the thing and Dr. South and I'm defining words and you know he, you know you could you know sometimes a guy like him can intimidate a little, little struggling holding this preacher like me but anyway anyway is our church relating to the issues that people are dealing with you know uh, are we are we actually giving them solution? You know, we tell you, stop that, stop that thing, stop that. But are we dealing with situations that are we addressing their issue? Right. When you say to a person, you know, stop fornicating. Well, let's talk about this. You know, what 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 is happening? You, 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 do you need to get married? Or what happened? I mean, there, there's a, and I'm not going into it. Relax, Sister Sheila. <laughs> but there's a lot of things that we need to talk about when we start telling people stop fornicating or 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 stop committing adultery. We need to find. We need to sit down and talk. Now, the Bible is right all by itself. But it can I have? Let, let me give you a case in point. Um, I know that the Bible uh, speaks against. Um, homosexuality. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, uh, and I'm very much aware of that. And I, and I stand with the Bible. Okay. Yes, sir. But I have at the church that I pastor some gay people and whether you want to believe it or not, m most successful churches have some gay people yes. and with the culture now, there, some of the people are gay and you don't know they're gay, okay? And then some of them just don't care. So I, the Lord put it on my heart uh, not too long ago, uh, a couple of years ago, to deal with this um, with this gay thing, you know, the the, the, the thing. And so I started uh, a, a, a ministry called Turnaround, okay? So without giving all of the particulars, I got up in my church one Sunday and I said, listen, I want everybody make sure you got my cell phone number. And uh, no, I, well, I, I approached it a different way. And I just said, uh, you know, everybody take this number down. That's how, that's how I did. And I said, take this number down. And I got up and said my cell phone number, which I don't care. It's 313-215-6518. That's my tell tell them Nate. That's my real number. Yes, sir. It is. <laughs> so I'm saying it to the whole world. That show you why I'm you know I'm I'm open. You know. So I got up and gave my my uh, number out, and my staff was looking at me. Say, he, 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 what is going on, Pastor Crazy? And so I <laughs> make sure you got that number down. And then when I got when I made sure everybody had the number down, I said, okay, now I'm starting this new ministry, and it's called Turnaround. And I said, I want to deal with those who are struggling with their sexuality. 
Well, I had to see you had to say the number before because if you'd have said what it was and and then they wasn't gonna write the number down, then nobody wanted to see, you know, and people been looking around, oh, he got trouble, you know. So you gotta the Bible says he that win souls must be wise. Yes. Okay, so we did that and we had a counselor, we got a a, a prayer warrior, one of our uh, uh seasoned prayer warriors, uh, we got a psychologist. You know, and all of them were a part of that ministry, and we were helping people who were dealing with their sexuality, and they could call me at any time and talk to me about. It. So you gotta, you know, if you see an issue, ain't no, ain't no sense of you running all fornicators out of your church. Yeah, you got to see, you got to explore some ways to get them saved. My my thing is, see, I believe, and, and I'm talking too long on this issue, but I believe uh, that sanctification is a process. Come on, sir. It says that I'm better today than I was yesterday, and tomorrow I'll be better than I am today. So if that is the case, then some people need help through that process. Yeah. And so we can't just repeat it. You know, looking for them to make these changes overnight. Let's help them through that. I, I know I talked too long on that. I'm sorry. No, that, that's really good, Bishop. First that's of all, rich. I, I appreciate you for tackling what is a hot topic in church today that people don't like to talk about. Yeah. I also appreciate you for, in so many words, making it clear that instead of just uh, uh, cutting folk because of their symptoms, we got to get to the root. Yeah, I appreciate you for that, for saying we got to love them, but that don't mean that we endorse them. Me loving you doesn't mean that I embrace the lifestyle, but I'm going to help you. And I, I appreciate you for that. In a second, we're going to transition into our next segment, but I want to allow time for Elder Bush to ask one more question. And for those of you that are watching, uh, the engagement tonight is absolutely amazing. If you have not liked yet, please like this post. Please share this post and uh, send in your questions in the comments. We'll try to get them. Come on, Elder Bush. Thank you, um, Sister and Nate. I know um, Sister Vickers had another question as well, but so I'm going to ask my question real quickly. I do want to brag a little bit about millennials, Bishop. I think sometimes we get the bad um, or the short end of the stick, you know, sometimes. But um, I actually serve at a church that I've been a member of for over 13 years. Um, my church is old school. Um, I can't share my pastor's age because he will get me if he's watching. <laughs> However, our church, we have, sun, we have Sunday school, Sunday morning worship, Sunday evening worship, Tuesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night service. And our pastor requires us, especially as me being an elder in the church, to be at all those services. The other thing as a millennial is that even though I, am, I travel a lot during ministry, I don't go anywhere without my pastor's permission, meaning that I don't tell my pastor where I'm going. I ask him if it's okay for me to go. And at times he has absolutely told me no, and I stay at home. So, so with that being said, at the age of 38 years of age, um, my career um, mindset is already focused on retirement planning. In that same manner, I am also asking um, the questions for my church, knowing that leadership transition is inevitable. When we think or look at the word secession, the root word is success. I believe if we are honest, our denomination in many regards, albeit celebrated, has not always provided successful leadership because we have been incapable of separating our emotional attachment to personalities um, versus non-biased criteria and qualifiers for certain positions. The Church of God in Christ is over 100 years old, but there are no governmental entities who practice the same infrastructure for 100 years after its inception and considers itself a success. I understand that certain things are only mastered with an amount of time and a level of proven experience. This is my question, Bishop. How do we rethink the criteria for leadership succession in a standardized manner and what mode is used to communicate them? What are your thoughts on the necessity of age or term limits, and are there benefits to them? How do we embrace the passing of the baton from a top-down perspective? Well, um, Brother Bush, I um, I have, and this I, I may get 
I may lose a few of you all with this, but I, you know, I got, I, I think, you know, I'll tell you, I'm, I, I mean, with all my heart, I, you know, I often say I may not be the greatest preacher. I may not uh, be the greatest administrator, but I promise you, you'll find nobody who is more sincere about ministry than I am. And so with that being said, um, I don't, I don't necessarily believe in um, term limits or, or or age limit. What I do believe is, is that I believe that people need to be honest and say that, um, uh, I, I, you know, I can't do it anymore. I, I've been fortunate. I, I succeeded a man who just said he came, Bishop H.J. Williams, God bless him. Uh, bless his memory. He just came and he said, you know, I'm not as sharp as I used to be. He said, and, uh, and uh, I just can't, I, you know, I don't, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to do it anymore. And he, uh, he, he recommended that I succeed him. And, um, uh, and then even, uh, you know, I mean, people see, because I've seen it both ways, uh, Ella Bush. I've seen uh, organizations have term limits and they've never reached their full potential because they're the, that leader know, but he gets in, uh, he gets in in the first two to three years, he's gotta, he's, he's gotta be straightening things out, getting things prepared for what he feels will be uh the 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 success of the church and then the next thing you know he starts getting the train on the track he had to get it and or trying to well let's since we've been progressive he got the plane on the runway and now all of a sudden his terms is up and so they never get the success that uh those organizations never reach the success that they could if it would be if the leaders now this if the leaders would be honest enough to say, hey, I can't do it no more or I've had enough, but don't just sit there because you know ain't nobody gonna bother you. You know, it's it's that that's the way I feel about that. So, um, you know, that, that deals with your issue of term limits and age limit. I'm, I mean, you know, I applaud, um, I applaud Bishop uh, Blake. You know, he got to a point where he he, he told us that um, you know let somebody else go. You know, I've taken you as far as I can take you, and he said let somebody else uh, take you a little further. Um, and 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 we are in a very 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 strategic season. You know, you can't just sit here. I'm I'm gonna say this again. True leaders lead through a crisis. We don't sit back and wait for the crisis to pass and then try to lead. So uh, at this point, uh, you know, if, 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 if you can't do what you need to do as a leader or, 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 or what have you, then you need to re you need to be honest with yourself and reevaluate. Uh, I, I appreciate you saying uh, you're 38 and looking towards retirement. I'm um, I'm 62 and I'm looking toward I'll be 62 and I'm looking toward retirement and I've got things in place and uh, hopefully um, you know just like my my company I turned it over to my son uh, what about five years ago and he took the company that I started and just revolutionized it you know I mean I mean just did it so I think that if we if we leaders are will take the time to make sure that the people who are possibly successors, that we tutor them or nurture them and let them know what we know. Uh, and then they can take what we know and get a hold to the things that, that they have in mind and take us all to another level. I hope I answered your question exhaustively, did I? You did, okay. Bishop. Just that one part about succession. Okay. And and succession. And, and succession. What are you what are you what are you asking me about what succession? You, what are you asking me about succession? So what is your thought process behind um, the progression? So a lot of times we have 
generations that served and it continues to serve. But by the time that it's time for them to step into the or to take the mantle, they're now yeah. over themselves. And yeah. do we really have a succession plan? And what, what are your thoughts about leaders um, doing that? Well, or yeah, having, I, I, be, I believe that we should have a, a plan of succession uh, that we should, uh, you know, um, I, I, I think I'm, I'm going I'm to give you a, 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 a I, Elder Nathaniel Green is a uh, is a uh, one of the brilliant young man. Uh, and and uh, I saw something in him. Uh, when I was over the youth department, I, I, when I was over the youth department, it, it's a it's a group. I, I there's a group of guys that came up that I saw something in them because I knew. Listen to this, Elder uh, Bush. I knew that I couldn't be the youth president forever. Okay, so I saw certain people, and I shouldn't just say men because I had I, we 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 had some ladies in 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 view, you know, who I knew had, if I can, if you let me get away with this term, who I knew had the juice and they could do the stuff that needed to be done. And uh, of course, um, Elder Green eventually was put over the youth church and, and, uh, and we, and, and that's another thing. Uh, we've got to be able to say, my sister-in-law said it to me, uh, the other day, you got to be able to recognize when your season is up in this particular area. Seasons change. Seasons. I'm gonna say that again. Seasons change. Uh, uh, one season, Esther was out in the field. The next season, she was the queen. Uh, 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 you, you understand what I'm saying? One season, David. Uh, he, he he was he was a shepherd out in the fields smelly and stuff but the next season or another season he was he's the king so seasons change uh, at some point uh, I got I, and, and and if I take the time to be hear what God is saying God I believe in my spirit that God tells us when it's time to put somebody in place I believe that I I, I and I may get some bad hits on that one, but I believe God, if we are really with God, first of all, we got to be in touch with God. If we ain't in touch with God, then, you know, we messing up anyway, because it's God's church. And that's sometimes people, listen to, listen to what I'm going to tell you. Bishop Williams lived an additional 10 years because he listened to the, he, he said that the Lord woke him up at two o'clock in the morning and told him to step aside and let this young man pass. And he lived an additional 10 years, I believe, because he was obedient to God. I believe, so, you know, sometimes we don't wanna hear what God is saying. And and I'm not trying to act like uh, I'm, so, um, I'm so deep until, you know, I obey everything God said because God told me to come off my job. And I say, oh, no, that's off spirit. <laughs> you, some of y'all heard me tell that story before. You know, God was saying, come off my job. And I was like, no, nah, man, uh -uh, I got a master's degree. You know, I'm teaching mathematics. I'm I only I only work half a day and getting paid for the whole day. And, Dang and it, Bishop. huh? Say and it, man. No, dog, and I'm like, uh, uh, that ain't, that ain't. I'm telling myself, I know that ain't right. That's all spirit, and I knew it was God. So what God, yourself say? huh? What yourself say? <laughs> See, he crazy. And myself says, self, you better get off this job. And so, he, eventually, I had to give in. But, but Elder Bush, I had to. I, I got sick, man. I, my, I, 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 you know, I got sick. Uh, uh, um, you know, because I wouldn't obey God. Well, watch me. I'm getting ready to say something. Y'all ain't going to like this. I was out of the will of God, but my church was still growing. Wow. Y'all don't like that one. I, bet you. I was out of the will of God, but my church was packed. People were still joining. God 
did not forsake the people because I was out of order. And then when I got back in order, he continued on. Yes. But I had, I mean, I had to be, I mean, Sister Vickers, I had to be put on my back in the hospital so I would obey God. And it was all about coming off my job. And I was like, uh uh, I got a wife and these two little kids. Uh uh. But, you know, God. So I think that if we are spiritual enough, then we know when it's time to move on, Elder Marlon. I, th I hope I got you that time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. All right. Wonderful, wonderful. Wow. What a tremendous uh, conversation we've shared in segment one. Thank you, Evangelist uh, Sheila Vickers. Thank you, Elder Marlon. Amen. 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 Awesome. 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 Uh, converse, uh, courageous conversation around cogent culture and climate. In our next segment, we're going to enjoy fellowship and conversation. Bishop Sheard uh, with two additional phenomenal facilitators. Uh, our first is Evangelist Lauren Sanders, um, who is a tremendous gift to the body of Christ. Uh, Evangelist Lauren Sanders, uh, she's on she's on now and, and, and sharing with us. And then also we have Superintendent Anthony Wheeler. Um, I want to share a little bit uh, about them with you. Uh, uh, Sister Sanders is from the Bethany Church of God in Christ, where her pastor is Pastor Roderick Sanders. Uh, she's a member of the Eastern Missouri, Western Illinois Jurisdictional Youth Department under Bishop Lawrence Wooten. Um, she's a graduate of Maryville University with a Bachelor of Science in IT Information. Um, and our second facilitator for this segment is the Superintendent Anthony Wheeler. He is the founder and senior pastor um, of Beacon Hill Worship Center, Church of God in Christ in Madison, Alabama, and the Beacon uh, Worship Center in Butler, Hunt, uh, Butler in Huntsville, Alabama. He's a district superintendent. He is a Princeton Theological Seminary trained fellow and a member of their seminary uh, fellowship. Um, he is an entrepreneur. He and his wife uh, support Kampala, Uganda, uh, local churches and ministries and orphanages. And they're going to come and share in a portion of this courageous conversation, um, which is going to center around taking the uh, Church of God in Christ, uh, denominational relevance and connections. So let's receive Superintendent Anthony Wheeler and Sister Lauren Sanders. God bless you. Uh, super. God bless you, Bishop Sheard. I want to say, first of all, how much I appreciate and thank you for this amazing opportunity uh, to be on this panel. Uh, yes, from Huntsville, Alabama, uh, Alabama First Jurisdiction with Bishop O.L. Meadows is my bishop. Uncle Bishop. Uncle bishop. Yes, sir. <laughs> Uncle Bishop. Yes, sir. Uh, the, this session has already been amazing. And so what I'd like to do, Bishop, and, and again, I do appreciate you for this amazing opportunity, is really jump right into our segment and the discussion and questions that we have as it relates to Kojic denominational relevance and relational connection. Uh, I believe every organization has what I call a body of work. Uh, any organization that's been around as long as we have has a body of work. The Church of God in Christ, as a matter of fact, has a rich history of impacting communities and shaping culture uh, from its racially diverse inception, uh, the civil rights movement in that, in that particular era. As a matter of fact, I was reading just today uh, that one person, asked, one columnist wrote and said that had it not been for Mason Temple, the, the Dr. King's last sermon would not have been captured or preached. Uh, they, they actually suggested that Abernathy would have never called him because there was no space that was available that was the size of Mason Temple that could have held it. And so uh, my question is, as we know all of these things about our church and significance, unfortunately, it seems that this story is not often told or told in totality. So my question to you, sir, is how do you think we can begin to retell the story of our church? Well, you know what? And you, uh, I, first of all, I'm super excited, Superintendent Wheeler, that you're here, man. Uh, this is a, he is a, uh, another example of one of these brilliant people and that I just like to be associated with. I mean, so I want to thank you for being here and uh, I'll get to you in a minute, Sister Sam. But uh, uh, Superintendent, uh, you know, Superintendent Wheeler, what has happened is how many times have you and I had to straighten people out 
because they said that Dr. King gave his last sermon, uh, his last speech at the Masonic Temple. You know what I'm saying? I mean, just misinformation and whatnot. But um, um, what what has to happen is, is that I think that we have to come. We, we, it's, it's called a full circle. Let's go back, you know, uh, and let's establish ourselves from what our founding fathers have laid. They've laid a tremendous foundation and people such as yourself uh, uh, have, 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 have grown and emerged to uh, such places where now people have to recognize you because of your preparedness, if you'll let me say it like this. The Church of God in Christ, first of all, yes, I'm not ashamed to say that I'm a, a Pentecostal church, that I'm a sanctified church. And I think that sometime uh, along our journey, people have 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 thought to say that we are sanctified was a, a, a matter of being identified with antiquity and that it was outdated. It, it's not outdated to be sanctified, you know, and 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 uh, I think somewhere along the line, we got that we got off track there. So now. Uh, there were some people, such as yourself, who said, I, I ain't ashamed of what I am. I know I say it. You hear me say, people say, how you doing? I say, oh, I'm doing pretty good for struggling holding this preacher, you know, and that that's kind of my fun line with it. But just because I'm sanctified doesn't mean that I'm unlearned. And just because I'm sanctified doesn't mean that I'm not knowledgeable of the different things that are happening. And so God, uh, we've got to, first of all, go back and become reacquainted with our holiness foundation. And once we become reacquainted with our holiness foundation, then we'll start taking, and I use this word not in a negative way, but I use this word, uh, but we'll start taking pride in who we are because we are some of the some some of the the greatest people in the world we just been some of us have been ashamed to say uh where we from I, you know I, I yeah you come to my church i can talk with any you can you can converse with any group of people uh I, I, let me tell it let me tell this story and, and then i'm coming back you know i'm a storyteller and there they be true stories uh nick watch yourself uh, but uh, I do tell some story. But what happened is I went to a very sophisticated uh, church, Baptist church, and um, they asked me to come over and preach. And so when I sat down and I uh, sat down and the assistant pastor came up next to me and she said, um, she said, um, Reverend Sheard. Uh, and I want you to know that we had you here because of your ability to converse on a level uh, that we would uh, expect uh, our speakers to. And they said, uh, I don't, we're not necessarily interested in all of that hooping and hollering, but we want you to come and give us what you have because we like the content of your message. And and I and I and you, you you may not know this side of me, Dr. Wheeler. So I turned and I looked at her and I said, Y'all know what I was when y'all invited me. <laughs> so I got up and you know I did what I usually do and then I and then I went right on into my hollering and screaming. And after a while, the Holy Ghost came in that church and the pastor jumped up and started running around the church. So my point is, you don't, we don't, we've got to be proud of who we are. And then we start building, we start building because uh, our, sanctif our sanctification, uh, our, our foundation of sanctification is not anything that we should be ashamed of, but we should build on it. And then that's the way we start making the church of God in Christ look better. I, I, I am even here and I know in different cities all across the country, now the church of God in Christ 
in in different cities they are they have a different recognition now because of our leadership because of the type of leaders that we are and what we become we're not up uh we're not up saying this and that and did that we, we we're speaking fluently it is up to the our group to to to, to change that concept that sanctified people ain't don't do nothing but roll around and shout we do more than that we got bachelor's master's degree we got phds uh we can run your whole school district uh we can we can we can run your city we got mayors now and so we just need to be proud of who we become yes sir thank you so much for that did Bishop. i ask you a question? Uh, okay yes sir all right absolutely Absolutely. Uh, sort of hinging on that question and going to my next question. Uh, today, uh, there are so many denominations and organizations that uh, churches or individuals can uh, choose to be a part of. Uh, there, there are so many and the choices are so, so numerous. My question to you is, as an organization, the Church of God in Christ, the simple question is, in what areas are we winning in? Uh, as it relates to credibility, our systems, uh, inclusiveness, uh, overall organizational leadership uh, that would actually be attractive to someone who's in a place where they're attempting to choose uh, an organization, a denomination, or church to be a part of. Uh, where, what are we winning in as an organization? What, what are our strengths as the Church of God in Christ? Um. Superintendent Wheeler, I, I want to say this, and I hope that I can uh, get away because you I, and I, I expected nothing less of you than to ask a hard question. But uh, but um, I had some pastors who had joined a Church of God in Christ, my jurisdiction, because of me and not the Church of God in Christ. Uh, and had them say, "On oh, you know, I'm I'm with you, but I ain't with the Church of God in Christ." And and that is because and I, and finally, and of course, I would tell them, I said, "Well, you can't be with me if you're not Church of God in Christ." It is up to us as leaders to inform them uh, what we're about, and we have to tell them in, in any organization, in any organization you're going to have some bad things happen, you know, but let's stop using that as an excuse not to be a part of the church of God in Christ. Well, I, I would be, but they, they hypocrites, it's hypocrites on your job. You go there every day though, <laughs> you know, I mean, Absolutely. and, 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 and furthermore, it might be hypocrites in your house, but you still, you still live there, you know? So, I mean, let's stop. That's, that's just a lame excuse. If I can say it like that, that's a lame excuse. But it's up to us leaders to be able to 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 sell the good part about the church. The good part about the Church of God in Christ is that it is biblically based. It's biblically biblically based. Our church, our doctrine is biblically based from the word of God. Uh, you can search the other denomination, and I know there are spinoffs. Uh, hear what I'm saying? There are spinoffs, but you gotta you gotta come right back to our foundation, and so that makes us a uh, that makes that's that's attractive to people who really are sincere. Now, one of the things that are, makes us uh, uh, very unique is that this diversity in our church. The diversity, in other words. Uh, you can still be traditional and still be Church of God in Christ, or you can be more, uh, give me a word, uh, South. Modern. 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 And still be Church of God in Christ. But our common denominator must be holiness. And so, you know, we, you know, uh, let, me, let me use my family uh, for an example. Um, my uncle... Uh, my and my cousin pastors his church now, and my cousin has what uh, some of us have uh, called a a a a rural church, and uh, he's a successful pastor in a rural church. 
My dad has a successful church in the city, but he's more traditional. I have a successful church in the city, but we're more modern. So, I mean, but we're all, my point is, is that we're all church of God in Christ and we all stick to our foundational beliefs, which is holiness. How is that, Superintendent Will? Yes, sir, Bishop. Thank you so very much for that. All right. uh, and even as you were talking on that, as I pivot to my, my next question, uh, one thing that you said that I really extracted from it is, as I even listened to you uh, uh, respond to it is, is actually being demonstrated. I believe that this year in this pandemic uh, actually becomes a billboard for our organization, uh, the way that the leadership of the yes. church has led this church. Uh, and, and I think that is a billboard of one of those areas that we're winning in. And I applaud uh, you and all the leadership for phenomenal leadership during this pandemic. And, uh, and so I think that's one of those ways specifically that we're winning in an organization our size uh, with our bandwidth. Uh, when crisis come, you got capable leadership that's able to navigate it. And, uh, and so that's one of those ones that I always communicate when someone asks that question. Pivoting to my next one is, is really uh, reimagining church. Um, there's some research and just from observation that shows that individuals are, a lot of individuals are more likely to respond to worship opportunities that are hosted in public spaces that they are comfortable with versus being in the church uh, or versus being in the cathedral. Uh, we have a, a movement that we have um, churches that are planted in movie theaters. Uh, there are some that are meeting in gymnasiums. There are some that are meeting in smaller venues like cafes. But what we're finding is that there, as it relates to the unchurched, uh, they have a lot of walls as it relates to coming into the four walls of a traditional church. Many of those people will meet in those uh, public spaces, as I'm calling them, versus coming into a traditional church because they've heard horror stories and different things that they don't understand that goes on inside of the church. However, if you're meeting them in a theater or you're meeting them in a school, then that's public space. So it seems to be a little more comfortable to them. Uh, so my question as it relates to that, how do you think it looks uh, to take the church? What does it look like to take the church from the cathedral to the community in 2021? Well, um, great question. Um, I, I, you know, I have done... Um, church in uh, perhaps all kinds of different settings. Um, I, I, once again, I, I, wanna, I wanna revisit this, what I said uh, earlier, ministry is meeting the needs of people. So sometimes we have to take our shirt and ties off. Uh, we have to minister to those, we have to make those persons who I, I like to dress, uh, Superintendent Wheeler. I, I love to dress up. You know, as a matter of fact, during this uh, pandemic, it was really a, a problem for me at first because I wasn't dressing up at all because we couldn't go nowhere. And so finally, I just got up on, started getting up on Wednesdays and Fridays and dressing up like I was going somewhere. It wasn't going nowhere. But uh, but sometime we have to make adjustments so that we can reach the people. Um doing the different kinds of settings, uh, you know, like we do an out, out, outdoor service or, or um, they, they had, um, uh, they have a setting in the uh, church where it's set up like a cafeteria and they, you know, they drinking water and coffee and stuff like that. And, but they have in Bible uh, teaching. The key thing is, is that, we got to we got to stay with our foundation. You see, uh, I I can I can teach you uh, if I'm if I'm riding on the wagon, or if I'm in the jet. Just as long as my message, our our methods may change, but our message must not change. And so I think that uh, doing these type of settings, different types of settings, like today, this is my Bible class night. But we're doing something different, and 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 we're getting a uh, uh, hopefully we're getting a great response. I don't know what the numbers are, but hopefully we're getting a great response. Almost, a thousand, almost a thousand viewers, Bishop. 
okay, well, we're doing something different because of how we are, how, this setting that we're doing and, and bringing you all together and doing this. So I just think that uh, uh, Dr. Wheeler, our, our message, our message, we, that's, what, that's what the key thing is. Our message must remain consistent or constant. Constant. That's the better word, uh, Elder Nick Sal. That our message must remain constant. Constant means that it won't change. I had a preacher one time. I preached, uh, Dr. Wheeler, the constancy of God. And uh, one of my preachers came and he said to me, uh, after I preached, he said, um, uh, uh, Pastor, I think you meant the consistency of God. And I said, oh, okay. I said, well, let's look it up. And I looked it up. And I told him, I say, the word consistent means that I'll do something most of the time a certain way. But the word constant mean I won't change. Say it, Bishop. And so we cannot change our message. It's got to, we got to be, we've got to be the called out group of people. Man, this is tremendous. Thank you so much, Bishop Shear. Thank you, Superintendent Wheeler. Um, as we transition to a part of the conversation uh, with Sister Lauren Sanders, let me encourage you to like and share, start a watch party. This is tremendous. Uh, the crowd is being so engaged, so positively passionate in the comments. We're enjoying them. Uh, Bishop Shear, needless to say, we appreciate your candor, uh, your clarity, your conciseness. Um, we're almost uh, almost finished. We have two more facilitators um, that are going to come and share. But Sister Lauren Sanders is here with us. Um, Superintendent Wheeler is a member of Generation X. Um, and while we appreciate the millennials, that's it, Superintendent Wheeler. Generation X has superpowers um, because we're that generation uh, that is committed to the institution, even when the even when the uh, institution may not benefit us at the moment. We love the Church of God in Christ. And we understand that as Generation X, the span of our influence is 20 years behind us and 20 years in front of us. And we're strategically placed to help push the church to its next level of success. And so on tonight, uh, Sister Lauren Sanders is going to come bishop. She has two questions that very succinctly and very expeditiously she's going to ask you. Um, and then we're going to hear those courageous responses from our general board member, Bishop J. Drew Shear, Sister Lauren Sanders. Yes, I'm so honored to be here with you all and with you, Bishop. Thank you so much just for this opportunity. Um, so excited to get into some of these questions. Uh, on one of our Zoom calls, Elder Nick uh, South said something so awesome, and I started to write it down. He said, don't steal that, <laughs> Lauren, but I'm letting you know tonight. I've been taking some notes, Bishop shared, and um, I'll give you credit, sir, when I, when I share them. <laughs> So, okay, um, my questions here are um, on the topic of managing versus building momentum, intentional development and placement. So in recent years, the gap between generations has definitely been felt by setting weighed, discussed from corporate America to the church. And when I was thinking about this subject, I was thinking about a time where um, my university, I think I was a sophomore, rebranded and they got a new logo and one of my uh professors kind of uh, gave us the understanding that this interesting new logo was not sister, sister lauren sister lauren i'm so sorry i'm so sorry to interrupt but we know what you're asking is so pivotal and poignant we seem to be getting a negative connection and not a good sound so if you could adjust your your sound your speakers um so that it can, we can get some clarity because we want to make sure that our listening audience and our viewers and Bishop Sheard are able to hear clearly and with clarity. So let's try, if you don't mind, if you could try that again. Are you able to hear me now? It's still not, it's still not better. Okay, while we're waiting on something on Bishop Sheard, you know, that's one of the great things about uh, Generation X, we have superpowers, we could change right in the moment. I mean, he keeps talking about this generation. He done threw his arms up like this. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, I hope Sister Lauren uh, can get back on because it was a joy to even see her and may yeah. God bless her. So I hope she can get back on. I know. Wow. That was unfortunate. That Absolutely. She, OK, let's try her now. There she is. She's in a whole nother. Oh, oh, no, still not working, Sister Lauren. I'm so sorry. 
Oh, Lauren, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Why don't we do this? We're going to just continue the conversation. And if and when Sister Lauren um, is able to get that sound connectivity, we're definitely going to bridge her back in. Okay. Um, uh, Superintendent Wheeler and Sister Lauren shared in their questions. And needless to say, their focus area was coaching denominational relevance and relational connections. Bishop Sheard, as we talk about building relational connections, talk to me about how you see your leadership and its impact in building connections with Generation X, millennials, but then all baby boomers and what we call the silent generation. Um, you've often been styled as a bridge builder. Um, and one of the things that we understand is that as a leader, you have a responsibility to the institution, even if it disagrees with individuals. Um, and we're at a very critical crossroads, uh, both in our world and in our organizational structure. How do you see yourself as a bridge builder um, across generational lines? Are they saying that it's, we kind of, we still distort it a little bit? No, sir. Are we good? We good now? Yes, yes sir. We should be good. Do you, uh, you want me to repeat the question, Bishop? I, I think I got you, uh, uh, Brother South. Uh, yes, sir. Talking about being, well, let me, just just give me the tail end, that's all. Okay. As a bridge builder, uh, statistics say that the scope of influence is 20 years in front of you yes. and 20 years behind you. Right. How do you see your leadership impacting across Generation X, the baby boomers, the silent generation? How do you bridge that gap without alienating anyone? Well, you know what? Um, um First of all, this is this is not a uh, this is not something that you and I'm, I'm so glad that you're on and and Dr. Wheeler, uh, because both of you all are are educators. And this is not something that you can go into the university and learn how to do this. <laughs> you know, first of all, you've got first of all, you have to have a love for people. And, and we're talking about leaders now. You got to love people. So uh, when you love people, I saw one of our leaders, not not our church leaders. I want to make that clear. I saw one of our leaders uh, when a child uh, was running near him and he did like that. I mean, he did, you know, like stop. I don't mind saying it now. He's number 45. He did like that. Well, that, that you know, that 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 spoke volumes to me because any leader that is not embracing whoever it is, is not really leading. I love senior people. I love senior people because I recognize that they have paved the way for me to get to where I am. So I love them. I appreciate them. You'll never see me. And I think those of you who know me, you'll never see me disrespect a senior. And yeah. I'm ready to almost fight you if you disrespect a senior, I, uh, uh, I I became the bishop and I became a general board member. And Bishop Williams, whenever he came in my settings, he always got my seat because I respected him. Uh, uh, whenever anything, you know, he come to my church, he sat in my chair and they said. And then I remember one of my uh, staff members said, well, you know, Bishop, you outrank. Bishop uh, Williams. Now I said, I don't care. <laughs> you know, if he, you know, this man made it possible for me. So then you got these little kids. Watch me. You can't be too sharp where you don't want these little kids to get their candy on your pants leg. Right. Ooh, pray, 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 pray for me, Bishop. Y'all ain't saying right. nothing. Pray for <laughs> you, know. but, yeah, right. <laughs> man, right. You know, because these. I, I the reason that I remember this, uh, Dr. Wheeler, I remember as a teenager just wanting to touch Bishop J. O. Patterson. Man, and so if you think about how you were when your heroes came around or she rose came around, then you ought to be mindful of that now that somebody thinks highly of you. So you'll never see me ignoring a person. You'll never. And and, and, and I think that is so uh, that's what makes me able to bridge these gaps. Now, Thank you, Bishop. Thank is, that what, is that what you wanted, brother? Absolutely. Tremendous, Bishop. Wow. What a great conversation with Superintendent Wheeler and Sister Lauren Sanders. Um, I'm sorry, 
Yeah. Just some Lauren then yeah. get in. I wow. think she's getting ready to come back in now. I just want her to talk. Try it, Sister Lauren. Say something. Hello, can you all hear me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, victory is ours. Okay. Look at uh, oh, millennials got power. You all well, <laughs> but I think. <laughs> Leave it to the millennial to have all the technical difficulties on tonight. Isn't that crazy? It's all right, sis. I'm going to, um, if it's okay, attempt to ask my questions. And even though I'm getting something choppy, our oh. audience will be able to hear Bishop's responses. So um, apologies, Elder Nick. I really didn't get, um, you know, the last question, but I'm going to go right into where I left off. Okay. That's fine. All right. Thank you all so much. So, um, as I was saying, in recent years, I think we have uh, experienced and felt the gap between generations. We've dissected, we have, have had dialogue on it. Um, and I was reminded just of an incident um, with my uh, university when I was around a sophomore where we actually rebranded and we got a new logo. And one of our professors let us know, hey, this logo um, was not meant for the current students. It was really meant for the future students down the road that are like in middle school right now. And so Bishop, my question to you is, how do we make sure the decisions that are being made today for our church are not uh, driven by the preference of one generation, so the baby boomers or millennials, um, but that they look ahead to future generations? That's an excellent question, Sister Laura. I'm so glad you got back on, and I appreciate you being on here with me. Uh, you, but you know, uh, here's the thing. Your, your professor made a very valiant, uh, a valiant point and a valid point, but it's a valiant point also, because um, if only if we are only doing ministry or or building for today, then we're not meet, we're not doing what God has called us to do, because the ministry shouldn't stop once I pass, but it should continue, and so I re, the the way that we uh, uh, the way that we do do that is we get, um, it's, it's always important to have the generation behind us included in our discussions about how we will build. Uh, um, I, I recall um, when, I, when I was over the youth department, um, I went in and, I, and they had people that were older than me doing the youth church and i said god bless you i appreciate you all but we revamped it and had young people that were putting youth services together that way it would be relevant for them and then at the same time we would have a monitor to make sure they didn't go off track so we've got to be able we one thing uh sister Sister Sanders, we got to do is we got to listen. You know, it, that's one of the things that we we're, we're not good at sometimes. It's like, and I and oftentimes I say I was on a meeting the other day and I say, you know, our listening skills are not good. We got to be able to listen because people will tell you what their needs are. The next generation will tell you what they need to happen so that they can be interested in ministry. But we got to be able to listen and then we got to be able to move them to a place where we say okay i see i've helped you develop you got it take it from here and then they got to be willing to help the next group behind us that's awesome bishop i love how you said you know just having the willingness to listen, I, you know, my my job as a part of the International Youth Advisory Council is to be sort of that bridge and that um, that voice for the young people to our leaders. And so I think that's what this, you know, forum is for today. And I, I really love that. Um, my next question for you in relation to that is what is the balance needed to maintain what attracted the current members and um, of the church and what uh, we want to employ that would attract uh, growth in the church. So I can read that again. 
Um, how do we make sure that we have the balance to maintain what has attracted the current members of the church while employing what attracts new members to grow the church? Yeah, I think I, I think I'm uh, I think I'm pretty much uh, going to pretty much say the same thing, you know, and uh, about being able to listen and hear and 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 ascertain what are the needs of the people and uh, being able to develop ministries. I talked about the turnaround ministry earlier, to be able to develop ministries that will meet those needs, to be able to, uh, you know, we need to sit down with, uh, and even with, uh, 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 you know, our, our pastors or our, our, our elders and, and evangelists and missionary. And let me hear, what can we do to help you? Uh, to eat, to help you uh, uh, become more astute in your ministry or to become more equipped or what can we help you to uh, what can we help you to do to become more effective as a soul winner and then you know some of the the best person uh, and a lot of times we try to uh, you know uh, push these people away but the best person to uh, get to uh, to get drug uh, drug addicts saved is a reformed drug addict. The best person to uh, reach uh, gangsters is a former gangster to get saved, you know? And sometimes we don't want to, they, they may be a little edgy. You know, I, I, I never forget, um, I had a couple of brothers in my church and they were just straight up gangsters and they would and uh they would be they got they got saved and they got in the choir and one would stand on one side and one stand on the other side and they had their dark glasses on and they'd be up there you know and and whatnot but it you know and then they would say to me don't you worry about nothing pastor I got the whole house. That 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 thing was still in them. And then my wife says to me, "Why is it that your ministry attracts these gangsters?" <laughs> but uh, don't 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 answer that, uh, Nick. Don't answer that. But but we gotta uh, let's let's employ all of these people in ministry, and let's develop ministry that will be effective to go after these people. Amen. Amen. This has been absolutely amazing. Thank you, Superintendent Wheeler. Thank you. 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 You're absolutely amazing. Listen, guys, we are in the home stretch of this amazing conversation. And uh, before I bring on the next two people in our final moments uh, that are going to be sharing with us, I want to encourage you again. Uh, I want everybody to like. I want everybody to share. Uh, encourage somebody to come and be a part of this conversation. Let them know they only got a few minutes left to jump on this train and be a part of this dialogue. And Bishop, you made such a very powerful point just a second ago. In so many words, it, it said to me that the church is for everybody. So, so this is what I'm going to ask. Everybody that's watching, I want you to put that in the comments. The church is for everybody. The church, put please put that in the comments right now. People that's need right. to see that. I want you to leave with that in your mind. The church is for the church isn't just for the church, but the church is for everybody. So thank you so much for that. I appreciate you. Listen, we have two more brothers that we're bringing on in our final in the final stretch, the home stretch of this conversation, and we're so glad to have them with us. Uh, the first one being Elder Adrian Harrison. Patterson Sr., uh, known this man of God for a number of years. Uh, let me just say, he just a good man, just a good brother, a uh, solid man of God. Uh, he hails from uh, Peoria, Illinois. He is the youngest child of Bishop uh, uh, and Lady uh, Patterson Jr. Uh, and on Sunday, August the 7th of 1994, he gave his life to Christ and has been running with a torch for Jesus Christ ever since. He's a father. He's a husband. He's a mighty man of God. And he's one of the brilliant minds of the Absolutely. church. Uh, you wouldn't know it unless you took the time just to sit and talk to him. A word of knowledge. Dr. Patterson, we're glad that, Elder Patterson, I'm sorry. We're glad to have you on with us on this evening. 
Also, we're glad to have with us uh, another a mighty young man of God. Uh, I, I can say I grew up with this brother. We grew up in the same jurisdiction, and uh, he comes from uh, an incredible uh, legacy. Uh, he is none other than Pastor Y.D. Uh, Burnell Thurgood Jr. And uh, he's with us uh, tonight. He is pastoring that great church down yeah. here in Virginia Beach, uh, Virginia, the New Jerusalem Church of God uh, in Christ. He also is a husband, a father, uh, and is very entrenched uh, in the throes of ministry. And Pastor Thurgood, we're glad to have you on with us, man. Oh, so, wow. Wow. Bless you, bless wow. you, bless you. So let's jump right into it. Um, this has been a year like none other. Uh, this pandemic has literally uh, shaken all of us to our core. And I, I would like to, to shift the conversation with the two of you into a dialogue uh, concerning some expensive lessons that we have taken from the pandemic. This pandemic has forced all of us to pastor differently, lead differently, connect differently. You got to touch, you got to stay in touch with folk that you can't touch. Um, it's just been a very unique season. And I, I, I think I'm, it's safe to say that all of us, uh, uh, none of us rather, have ever gone through this. So we were all novices when it came down to this. But I'd like for you two to address your questions uh, on this evening concerning uh, expensive lessons from the pandemic. God bless you. Thank you so much, Elder Green. God bless you, Bishop Shear. Bless you, brother. Uh, Thank you, sir. First off, thank you for this opportunity to serve on this panel uh, with such great men and women of God. I'm excited and delighted to be a part of the uh, Courageous Conversations panel on this evening. And uh, Bishop, with your permission, uh, I would like to dive right into our area of discussion, if that's all right with you. Sure, sure. Yes, sir. Uh, tonight, my specific uh, area of discussion focuses on churches profiting within and learning from this current pandemic that we're yet experiencing. Uh, pastoring in the pandemic is something that no one in my generation uh, has experienced, of course. And with that being said, there are a few expensive lessons that I myself and I think many other leaders have learned uh, during this pandemic that has changed and reshaped our way of thinking uh, in reference to financial planning and making preparations in the event of emergencies. Uh, with there being no set time when this pandemic will subside, uh, there's a strong possibility that we will not be able to enter into our churches or our places of worship uh, or host our events at full capacity for maybe the next year, maybe even two years. Uh, Bishop, my question for you is, as a general board member, what financial planning a framework would you employ that would uh, help the church to be in a stable financial position post pandemic? Well, um, man, first of all, let me say how uh, delighted and excited I am that you're on here, man. You know, I, uh, man, I love you. I love your family, man. And, right. and, uh, just God bless you, brother. Thurgood. You. You, my, you my man. Yes, <laughs> you my man. Uh, bless you. But, uh, here, here, what, what we deal, what we've dealt with, and uh, this has been, and you know, I'm not going to try to act like um, I'm a Superman. Uh, this this season has been, without question, the most difficult season of my entire life. Uh, of course, you know, I lost my mom. I saw my dad go down, and I know some people are getting tired of me saying my testimony, but I don't care. I'm I'm thankful. Uh, I saw my dad go down to almost, uh, well, he was a 138 pound weakling and he couldn't hold his head up, couldn't stand up, but God had brought him all the way back. And, you know, he's eating, preaching and his weight is still going up. And uh, of course, uh, uh, it's just been a season of pain. But uh, as I was going through this very difficult season, I became very concerned because I'm a you know, when all of, you take all the rest of my positions away, I'm a pastor at heart, man. I love pastoring and it's something I like to do. You know, you got some of these guys that are that that are pastors and they like, oh, man, you know, now that that ain't me, man. I, I mean, I, if it was up to me, we'd be in church seven days a week you know, because that's what I like to do. And so um, I, and then here's the other thing. I like people. You can't be a good pastor and don't like people, you know. So uh, when I when it got to the point, and my church has been closed since the third Sunday in March, and so uh, 
when it got to that, I had to start discovering ways to to uh, to 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 do what I was called to do, and that is minister and pastor. And so we started exploring different things. Um, then I became concerned because I'm a bishop, and I had to explore ways to try to help my pastors to keep doing what they were called to do. And so we came up with uh, you know, the ministry. Uh, Superintendent uh, Green was with me. We came up with the stretch. And and one of the things we did uh, is that we encouraged people to become somewhat computer literate. Uh, now, you know, uh, one of my dear friends said to me, the time is coming that perhaps when the bishop tells you uh, to go start a church, only thing he gonna give you is a computer. Uh, it's it's uh, we living in a day and time where uh, we've got to be able to take what is being dealt to us and then mold it, make it, break it, uh, you know, whatever we got to do so that it works for what we we've, we've been called to do. I like to say this because um, there at the beginning when the television first came out, our forefathers called it the one eyed demon. <laughs> And, and, and that one-eyed demon, somebody had to be bold enough and courageous enough to get it on the one-eyed demon and do ministry. And then look how many thousands and hundreds and maybe even millions of people has, have received the Lord Jesus through TV ministry. Then in our day, when this social media came out, they were saying that that's, that's, of the, that's demonic, that's of the devil. But now we've taken social media and made it a ministry. And of course, there's some demonic stuff on there, but we done something. My church is growing, uh, uh, Pastor. Uh, my church is growing during this season. Yes. We're taking in so many members until I had to start a new ministry to keep up with the new members that's coming in. So uh, we've got to be able, uh, and then, uh, you know, the thing is, is if we ever get back, in the church, what I believe we will. But when we get back, one of my challenges is, is that I may not know the faces. So, I mean, it's a, that's a good thing. I, I may not know the faces, but that's a good thing. And so, but we've got to be able to keep ministering, make our, uh, we can't, we cannot take down, we cannot uh, let up because we're in this pandemic. We've got to use our tools uh, to do. And once again, I, I know I sound, I know I'm recapitulating, but I got to say it again. Uh, true leadership is leading through a crisis. Amen. Not sitting up with our hands folded, waiting on the crisis to be over. So I hope I answered your question, Pastor. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very thoroughly. Thank you, Bishop. Okay. Uh, I had one more question for you, yes. then I would digress. Uh, on the topic of finances, I've been talking to many pastors and uh, other leaders. And uh, we've been talking about during this time, during this pandemic, financial accountability and transparency in the church. I know at times it can be uh, somewhat of an elephant in the room for a lot of businesses and sometimes certain ministry. Uh, I noticed here personally that given this increase since we made it so that the top peers of our church can come and see the books at their request in the effort to kind of boost the morale during the pandemic. Uh, as a local pastor in the effort to create a culture of trust and transparency, I periodically have conversations with our staff and financial uh, uh, operators here. Uh, my question for you, Bishop, is what would be your post-pandemic goals or what fiscal frameworks would you recommend to introduce this type of culture, a culture of transparency to the National Church? Well, I think the key is, is what you just said, uh, yes. Pastor. We've got to be open. If, 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 you, if you don't, if you're not willing to be open with the uh, finances, then it's almost implying that you got something to hide. Uh, and I don't, I don't, uh, I don't play with, with, with God's people's money. I, I mean, that's just something I don't, uh, you, you know, you, you won't, no one has ever accused me of stealing money, the church money, because that's not anything that I want to ever be guilty of. But here it is. We got all of these different venues to give. When we get, when we get to the end of this session, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to pop up on the screen ways you can give to the ministry. And uh, we've got to be able to, at the same time, uh, I know at our church, uh, you know, I have a business meeting and then I tell the people at 
at a certain time in January, the the uh, books are open. You may go in and you may see uh, what happened. You may ask questions and whatnot. And that's just a good practice. It's a and 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 I'm gonna tell you something, Pastor. Um, um, I've been pastoring now for uh, thirty. I think it's thirty six years, something like that. But um, along my along the way, uh, I, I I kept doing this, uh, telling the people you can go and see the finances anytime you can get it and look at it and whatnot. Any questions you want to ask me, you're free to do that, whatnot. And do you know, I think for the last five or maybe 10 years, I've had nobody go in to ask about the finance because I've, I've gained their trust and they know, I mean, this there, we balance. I got an accountant, you know, we got we got an accountant, we got a lawyer, we got all them people in place. And, uh, you know, we give the money for the tax returns and whatnot. But uh, uh, so we're going to have to do the same thing here. And we're going to have to, I, 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 I gather that we're going to have to, those persons that are given to our ministry, we're going to have to put a form up and mm -hmm. ask them to fill it out and we'll give it back. But we need to be keeping track of right. all funds that come to our church. And I'm a I'm a I'm a stickler for that kind of stuff. And I'm a stickler for I can tell you uh, I, I got I remember one year I got to the end of the year and did my financial statement and uh, I couldn't find 14 cents. <laughs> and, and man, I just kept going back over and over. I couldn't find the 14 cents. And I went and I went to the church and I told them, I said, we 14 cents off. And they were like. Pastor, please, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pay the 14 cent, but I mean, you got to be that, you got to be that way about the, about the Lord's work. And so we have ways to do it. We, um, even during this pandemic, pastor, uh, I was, uh, um, I got a, uh, I came together and, and, uh, put together what we call the JDS ministry relief fund, where I wanted to help some pastors who were struggling. And we raised uh, approximately a hundred thousand dollars. And every dime, every dime that we raised during that season, uh, I gave it to the different ministries. And you can everybody that made contributions to it, they can find out exactly where that money is. So there are different ways to do it, you know. And and then of course with this uh, YouTube and whatnot, you can even get you you can make money. Uh, by broadcasting your services on there. And I don't have all of the particular, my staff knows how to do it, but you can do that also as far as uh, um, doing the, uh, um, you know, um, uh, you can talk about that as far as uh, bringing money to the ministry. You know, I, I was the, I was the, uh, as, as you, many of you may know, I was the president of the youth department. And I, I'll never forget that I got called in because they wanted to know what was going on. I was having these rallies across the country and they wanted to know where that money was going. Mm -hmm. And I went in before the general board and I gave them the uh, I, I had a little booklet uh, and I presented it to all the board members. They looked through it. And and when I left that meeting, they was fussing at me for giving the money that was for me away to the people that traveled with me. I mean, we just, I, I, you just got to be, you got to be honest when it comes, when, when we took, when we took over AIM, uh, you know, every year I went before the trustee board and they, they did what they needed to do. They saw our books. We made a report. Uh, we turn in when I left AIM, we left AIM with about $160,000 in the treasure and we gave uh, a, a cashier check to the national church of four hundred thousand dollars so you know you when you start talking if you want to get money you got to show that you can handle money you know there's an old saying says you can't put a hungry dog in a meat house talk bitch. Come on, bitch. Come on, bitch. i need to make sure i heard that's five. That's over five hundred thousand. Well, that's how much we left with. Now that's not including what we gave on a yearly basis. Wow. But that's what we left aim with, wow. and uh, uh, we we left aim in good shape. We left the youth department in good shape when I was 
uh, moved from the youth department. The only thing is, is that when I took the money uh, from the youth de- that the youth department had left and I gave it to the presiding bishop, who was uh, Bishop G.E. Patterson, he took that money and put it in the uh, national treasure. So the next president didn't get the money. <laughs> wow. We kind of laughed about it uh, afterwards, you know, but uh, you it, it is incumbent upon us in this. And, and, and excuse me if I sound passionate about it, but in this world where people are stealing and, and, and people are, are taking money and, 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 and doing unscrupulous things and, and taking church money and not doing, you know, and, and buying all this crazy stuff. It, it, in this kind of world, uh, God wants to use people who have integrity with money. And if you have integrity with money and uh, and can show people where their dollars are going, they don't mind giving it to you. Amen. That's good. I hope I hope, I know I was kind of long. I hope I answer. I hope I was okay with that answer, Bishop. That was excellent. Thank you, sir. Listen, that that, ex, that information was valuable and much needed. I'm learning, sitting at the feet of wisdom on this evening. Uh, at this time, I digress and I hand the floor over. Bless you. Thank you, sir. God bless you, Bishop. All right, man. God bless you, Bishop Sheard. It is a signature honor of mine to be in conversation with you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your space. Thank God for you, Bishop Sheard. As a matter of fact, I believe I'm one of the 800 people that <laughs> jotted down your phone number when you read it on. Bless you, man. You know, you know I love you, man. Your dad is my friend, your mom, and uh, your, your whole family is very dear to me, man. God bless you, Brother Patterson. And we, yeah. God bless you, sir. We think the same of you. And of course, my focal area is with respect to pastoring uh, in the pandemic uh, as well. And I'd like to pose to you uh, two subject areas uh, as we uh, proceed in this. And much of this you've actually already stated, but I'm hoping that you can give me a different take on it uh, as well. Beginning in March 2020, when the coronavirus was deemed and declared a pandemic, Professional sporting associations closed, restaurants closed, academic institutions closed as well, and churches were recommended to limit our gathering sizes. Well, many pastors interpreted these, quote, restrictions, unquote, as an attack on their religious freedom. And some even went as far as to say, this is possibly the beginning of government controlled church. So many, remained open. Many did not adhere to the gathering sizes. However, so many others, including our church and my wife, Pastor Bishop Patterson, acquiesced. My questions to you are threefold. How have you been able to balance your divine charge to shepherd the people of God and still obey government recommended restrictions on gatherings? How have you been able to ensure their safety and then have you received any backlash from your position or any commendation on your position? Brother Patterson, great question. I have an excellent relationship with our governor and uh, I support her 100 percent. And uh, and she and I have been in dialogue and I've been in constant uh, uh, conversation with her office. And uh, of course, I am the. Uh, chairman of the uh, Michigan Canadian Council of Bishops. And so I had meetings with them also. And I and I urge people to obey the laws of the land, <laughs> the governmental uh, uh, restrictions. Um, you know, um, the Bible uh, gives us uh, uh, about obeying those who have the rule over us. And, and so, uh, I I did uh, what they said. You know, I know they said that we could have services. At one point, we could have up to fifty people. Uh, that wouldn't that wouldn't benefit me. That would just make my people mad because uh, I would have so many that couldn't get in. And so I did not I did not even try that. I didn't try that because I didn't want to make my people mad. And I figured if I let fifty in, then I'm gonna have a uh, another at least 10 that was going to be mad. <laughs> okay. So um, I, I, I went on and, and I shut the doors 
of our church and began to do the ministry on social media. Um, so to answer that question, yes, it is. I think it is very important. And then um, it wasn't an attack on the church. I think we get this kind of confused at times because I, you know, I, I mean, well, here, but let me say it like this. Uh, the devil may have meant it as an attack on the church, but I think that those government officials, for the most part, they were looking out for the people who they were elected to lead. Amen. And I think that that is key that we as leaders have to be very careful that we are looking out for the well-being of the people that we lead. I mean, the, the, the shepherd, uh, you know, I like to I like to use this uh, uh, scenario. The shepherd uh, uses he has a staff. Yes, sir. And, and that staff uh, on, on one end is a pointed edge. And on the other end is a, a hook, uh, uh, that loop. And on that, that shepherd uses that staff. And when one of his sheep goes astray, he uses that hook and pulls him back in. And uh, but when the when the when the wolf comes, he uses the sharp end to, to, to push him away. Now, hear what I'm getting ready to say, because there are certain times when that sheep, even though that shepherd keeps saying uh, pulling him in, or he keeps speaking, uh, he still does what he wants to do. That's the time that the shepherd will take the sheep and break his legs. Mm. So, Y'all don't want to hear this one. Come on, push up. He breaks his legs and then he holds him in his arms so he can become more acquainted with his voice. And mm. he keeps him there. And then when he when his legs heal, he lets him go again. But now he knows his voice. So mm. So sometime, sometime, oh, y'all ain't gonna like me. Sometimes <laughs> got be you, know that, man. you feel that thing, Bishop? <laughs> My God. Sometimes our legs gotta be broke so we can become more acquainted with God and hear what God is saying. God has not called us. Oh, help me. God has not called us to put his people in into unsafe situations. Amen. That's not what a shepherd is supposed to do. And so, um, uh, yes, I, I closed and uh, right along with your father, I closed and uh, but I, I yet do ministry and we're doing very well. We're doing very well. And I think my people are appreciative because not one of my members contracted COVID because we were in service. Not Amen. one. That's good. Now, some of them caught COVID because, uh, but away from our service, but not one because we were having service. And that in, in and of itself, that is a good thing to be able to say. Amen. Such yeah. a wise response. And uh, like any other preacher, I feel like we can really go in uh, yeah. after that. Uh, I do have a follow-up question. Certainly hope not to break its momentum, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> also, with respect to pandemic principles, some of the lessons that we've learned because of what we went through, these adverse situations. One primary impact of the COVID-19 pandemic was the crippling of one of the hallmark aspects of our beloved denomination, our fellowship. Following our national leadership conference in January earlier this year, one by one, we witnessed the cancellation or the postponement of our treasured national conventions. Subsequently, many jurisdictions and districts and local churches also canceled or postponed their annual events. In so doing, we've grown more dependent upon technology. Many in-place worship experiences have been replaced with virtual worship experiences and many on-site meetings have been replaced with Zoom meetings and other platforms. Uh, with Zoom growing their stock more than 480% in one calendar year. My question to you, sir, going forward, in what degree or to what degree should our national church explore or invest in relevant, reliable, and secure technological means to connect, to collaborate, and even to conduct the business affairs of our church? 
excellent question. And I, I was getting ready to try to see uh, something that I wrote earlier uh, this week on that very topic, but my uh, iPad is dead and battery is gone. So, so I'm going to try to hit you from uh, memory. It is, uh, it, is, it is most essential that the, uh, the national church, uh, and, and I, let, me, uh, let me applaud uh, 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 Bishop Thuston uh, for his perseverance in trying to have a virtual, uh, a virtual general assembly. And, you know, of course, we had a few kinks in it, but nevertheless, uh, we have started into the future, if you'll let me say that. We have begun in the future. And so it is so important that we understand that we're not going to be able to have these conventions uh, like we've had them in the past. And so that means that the different uh, departmental leaders or convention leaders are going to have to become acquainted uh, with this uh, uh, virtual aspect of ministry. Hear what I'm saying? The virtual aspect of ministry. Now, there will come a time when uh, I believe that we will be able to congregate again. And then even then, even then, uh, we're still going to have to use some uh, virtual ministries because as many people were complaining, we were having too many national meetings. And so we're going to have to use some of the virtual ministries to kind of cut that down. But at the same time, uh, we're going to have to become our leaders, the leaders. And when I say our leaders, I'm talking to people about the people who are in charge of these different conventions. Uh, they're going to have to become more virtually a stoop, or they're going to have to surround themselves. Here, it's not always uh, 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 what a person has to do, but they're going to have to surround themselves with a group of people, or people, or a person. I would like to think a group of people, since we're talking about the national church. Now, a group of people who are astute in social media and who can get this uh, virtual ministry into the most uh, excellent setting that is possible. We can't do it uh, with, uh, with, with, with tackiness. It's got to be done in excellence. And so therefore, we've got to make sure we know what we're doing and how we're going to move in this direction. It's got to be done, Brother Patterson, and we cannot, we cannot coil up and say, I'll just wait. If, you, if you're too scared to move into the future, then you're not prepared to lead in this day and hour. Wow. What a statement. Wow. What a statement. Wow. That this was powerful. Is, yeah. This has been incredible. Um, thank you again, uh, Pastor Thurgood and Elder Patterson for your input tonight. We absolutely appreciate you. Um, this has been uh, really an impactful conversation. Um, and the comments really prove uh, that to be true. And in just a moment, we're going to have Bishop uh, to give us final remark, closing remarks, and we're going to ask that he would pray for us uh, as well. Uh, but but I just want to say thank you so much, Bishop, uh, for allowing us to be a part uh, of this incredible experience. Thank you, uh, uh, Elder South. I'm going to ask you to have words in just a moment as well. But it's been a joy, man, working with you uh, to help coordinate this. And uh, there are just a few dates uh, that I want you all to be mindful of. What I love, what, what I love about Bishop Shear, uh, he is someone who is just so loaded with information. His poor never stops. P O U R. His poor never stops. And when we came into this pandemic space, uh, my my experience with him initially was, he said, "I got to figure out how to help these pastors that are trying to figure out how to pivot uh, in this particular space." And so uh, he came up with this concept called stretch. And I want to invite all of you to join us January the 11th. Uh, stretch is coming back. Uh, that initiative was rooted in trying to help pastors and leaders to pivot during these uncertain times. And stretch is coming back on February, the, I'm sorry, January the 11th uh, with a conversation about vision. 
Uh, glad that Bishop Sheard has employed his, his, his ecumenical uh, uh, connections to bring into that conversation Apostle Ivy Hilliard. And so he's going to be with us in that dialogue. But I'm also glad that he is very much in touch uh, with the expertise that we have right in our organization, the Church of God in Christ. And we have none other than Superintendent Terry Ellison that is going to be sharing in that setting as well. So I especially want you to mark your calendars for January the 11th. We're going to be talking about vision. Another date I want you to mark as well is February the 8th. Please mark February the 8th. I have seen hundreds of people comment tonight and say, this needs to happen again. Well, guess what? We've already made plans for this conversation to happen again. Uh, we've been talking with millennials and Gen Xers tonight, but this dialogue is going to continue on February the 8th with our silent generation and with baby boomers. And so you don't want to miss that dialogue. It's going to be incredible. Thank you again for this time, uh, Elder South. And then we will hear closing remarks and prayer from Bishop Shear. Man, I think you've echoed all of my sentiments, Superintendent Green. Again, thank you to all of our guest facilitators. What a tremendous time we've enjoyed on this evening. Um, intellectual spirituality is, is what uh, the Generation X and Millennials represent. Thank you to all of our uh, listeners, our viewers, the, the comments, the correspondence has been just tremendous. Um, to all of our friends, thank you for sharing. Can't wait to see you all again in our next session of Courageous Conversations. Thank you so much, Bishop Sheard, for the privilege to be a part of this on this evening. Well, I want to thank you all. It has absolutely been a pleasure. I, I love this kind of stuff, and uh, I want to thank uh, uh uh, Superintendent Nathaniel Green, who is doing an excellent job in ministry. I want to thank Elder South, who is one of the brightest minds we'll ever meet. And uh, of course, these very fine guest panelists that we brought in. And uh, it was just absolute. God bless there's Bishop Patterson, my friend, your dad, Elder Patterson, my man. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I want to thank all of you all that came to be a part. And uh, I love you with the love of the Lord. One thing I, I want to say that um, uh, if you don't love everybody, uh, don't die. Mm. Because your entrance into heaven is so important that there should be nobody that can stand in your way from getting there. And, you know, it, it, sometimes you got to grow to that. But don't let there's nobody in this world that important to stop me from getting into heaven. Have you ever thought about that? So that's why we got to love everybody. And so uh, I, I want to appreciate you. I want to ask that. Uh, uh, I think that our uh, facilitators are going to put up the different ways of giving. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, this is, of course, my Wednesday night service. And so uh, we're going to give and I don't want my. Uh, I, I got, don't get me wrong. I got a great church. I, I, I don't have the kind of church where me and the deacons or me and the board are against each other. We, we don't have those kind of things. So I'm just having fun when I say that, but I don't want them to say Bishop had this thing and you can get no money for the church. You know how the officers are, you know? So uh, please give, you can give on our cash app at dollar sign G E I Kojic one at PayPal at geicogic.org. You can text to give at 28950, and then you can type in GEI offer or space and the dollar amount. They're going to put all that on the screen, and it's rolling at the bottom. And I'm going to ask this for many of you who will, if you'll just make a sacrifice of $10, that may not be a sacrifice, but just, just give $10. And uh, that will be so much appreciated. I want to thank you again. I want to certainly thank God for all of you being a part of uh, their giving. And I'm going to pray over your gift. And I, I guess, and you know what, since I got Elder Green here, pray over those gifts, Elder Green. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you so much for this distinguished opportunity to sow into the kingdom work. I ask now, Father, that you would honor every seed and that you will bless every sower. We thank you, Father, that even their obedience is what is going to open great doors for them. And so I pray, Father, that you would give them great manifestation of favor and blessing and increase 
in this season because of their obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And um, may God continue to bless all of you. And uh, now I think that we're finished, Elder Green. I think I got everything. And now I'm going to have my dear brother, Pastor uh, Thoroughgood, to say the prayer of benediction. <laughs> Bless you, Bishop. Let us bow our heads. Kind and gracious Father, we thank you for this evening. Father, we thank you for this coming together of minds, oh God. We thank you for Bishop Sheard, oh God, and for his vision uh, to set the path straight for those who are coming after him. Father, we pray that you will bless every ministry in the Church of God in Christ. Look upon our presiding Bishop, Bishop Charles E. Blake. Father, we pray that you will strengthen us in the times to come, oh God. We do not know what stands before us in the year 2021, but we know that you hold tomorrow, and we know that everything is in your hands. Father, we thank you at this time, oh God. Keep us safe from our hurt, harm, or danger. Let no death or destruction come nigh us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. We give you the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you. Love you all. Love you, Bishop. Thank you, sir.